Okay, let's get started. Welcome everyone to our A to J Authors Summer Highlights webinar series. I'm Jessica Frank, A to J Authors Proje uh, Project Manager. And I set up this series to give us each month of the summer an uh, introduction to something that is interesting happening in the document assembly community, featuring A to J author with a focus on a legal aid or organization, a law school, a court, and a nonprofit, and different ways in which you can use form automation to advance the access to justice goal. So with me today, I have Luigi Bai from Lone Star Legal Aid. And Luigi is going to introduce himself in just a second. But the way this is going to work is that I'm going to ask Luigi a series of questions. He's going to demo a really cool project that his team is working on. And then we'll save time at the end for any questions that you have. Luigi, do you want to introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about your organization and how you became involved in document automation and legal technology. Sure. Thanks, Jessica. So uh, my name is Luigi Bai. I'm a managing attorney at Lone Star Legal Aid. Prior to going to law school, I had about 20 years experience in the software industry. So I'm actually a relatively new lawyer. Um, prior to coming to Lone Star Legal Aid, I worked at a different uh, legal aid organization where I spent part time working with uh, self representing or, you know, pro se litigants, working with them to understand what, what the law said, what legal information they needed to move another step forward in their process. So really came into Lone Star. Uh, with that background, which was good because in 2019, when I came to Lone Star, I came on board to manage a project that was disaster related. So we were building two portals, one for disaster survivors and one for disaster attorneys who were volunteering. Uh, the one for the attorneys we used to train people up on disaster topics so that they can hit the ground running when inevitably in Texas, Florida, uh, a disaster hits, right? Um, but the disaster survivor portal was interesting. Um, it was designed to cover seven different legal topics that disasters touched on and uh, really gave people an opportunity to figure out how to help themselves. So that's that's how I started coming into this. Since then, um, you know, our team has built upon that, especially since COVID, we've built a number of different tools to help people, you know, help themselves. Was the disaster portal the first jump or first toe in that Lone Star Legal Aid had had uh, with document automation? Or was there some other origin story that jump started your organization's journey into document assembly? Yeah, that really was our first jump into sort of a big scale document uh, document production that was public facing. I can't really think of something else that we did prior to that project. So. How many forms did you have with your with your first project with the disaster survivor portal? Well, so we um, we organize our our interview tools a little bit differently than focusing on like a one to one tool per form. Um, what we uh, organize it the the way we organize it is looking at a, a topic, deciding what are the things that somebody can do to help themselves in that area, like family law or landlord tenant or debt collection, and then um, doing kind of what looks like a triage tree, but isn't quite because it's focused on trying to determine what somebody can do on their own. So like a normal triage or issue spotting would be focused on legal issues that, that a lawyer can help with, right? Because you want to see how you can help out your client. Uh, this is focused a little bit differently in the sense that we're trying to drive people, trying to decide where people are in a legal area and then um, tell them what the next step is. So in that sense, each interview in, can end up with a number of different forms. Uh, they can be court filings. Uh, there are letters to landlords or creditors or mortgage servicers. You know, so, so really there are a number of different exit points. And uh, I don't really have a good sense of exactly what the inventory of those are. I know how many... In, uh, interviews that we have, but as we keep expanding them, they lead to different forms, usually more is, forms. Is that sort of holistic approach of helping the person get to wherever they need to get rather than accomplishing a specific goal? Is that Lone Star's approach to your website in general? Um, sort of the larger meeting people where they are and helping them figure out their situation and then producing the document or the resource that they might need? Is that sort of Lone Star's approach in general, the website? Yeah, I'm hesitant to say what Lone Star's approach is because I'm a managing attorney, 
Um, mm-hmm. But it's definitely the approach of our our group. And we want to encourage people to keep coming back. And, you know, one of the things that we were trying to react to is the idea that um, a visitor would come to our site and try to find some legal information. And we would give them this big thing, right, that would try to help them, you know, maybe through a multi-step process or explain a big area of law in which they really only have a part. Um, we wanted to take, and this comes from my experience working with with pro se litigants, with self-representing litigants. People, in my experience, have the bandwidth for one thing at a time, right? I mean, what this this is a big deal in their lives, and it's not the only deal in their lives. And so, if we can help them in a way that gives them the next step and maybe the next form to file, and then they can come back and say, "All right, I've been through this. Where do I go next?" That really has been the approach that I've promulgated internally here based on my experience. I love that. That's a lot of the philosophy behind Ada J author, that it's like one bit of information at a time. You don't need the entire, you know, entirety of the legal process. You need to know how to answer this one question right now so that it's not overwhelming. And I also think that's a different approach than maybe some of our um, attendees may have seen of uh, one off, you know, someone hits the website, they get the form they need and they leave. But your approach is more um, you expect to have a relationship through your website with these people in which they, you know, find the help they need for this one instance or this one form. um, And then they build trust in the project and the program and then are coming back to you multiple times. So I like that as an example of. Um, something that is innovative and a little bit different than what we see in the document assembly community. Yeah. That's uh, one of the reasons, oh, I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say it's one of the reasons why we chose A to J, right? I mean, we we built this disaster portal using a different technology, but when COVID hit, we knew that we needed to build out more things and rapidly. And, um, you know, the user testing that y'all have done with the user facing part of A to J, uh, the fact that you can do, you can uh, explain with pop-ups, right? The, key phrases or um, individual terms, you know, you can illustrate them with uh, images or videos or more text. Uh, You can do sort of a a page level learn more and give a holistic uh, additional bit of information. Um, I think that really helps because it's, it's when you organize things like that, the way A to J does in the, in the chunks of pages, uh, I think it really, it helps people understand things a bit at a time and they can come back. Yeah, you guys actually use pop-ups in a really innovative way as well. Um, I've spent the last couple of months doing a training revamp and really diving into the different parts of the software. And I'll talk about the training revamp um, at the end of this webinar. But um, it's had me spending a lot of time with our training materials and going deep and trying to get examples to show how the tool is used. And your use of pop-ups is, uh, is really innovative. And so Lone Star worked with us on a small uh, grant that they funded for us to do the work, to take all of the accessibility work that we had in Learn Mores and the interactivity in terms of video and graphics um, and additional text and add that into the pop-ups. And it's really interesting to see how you guys use that. And so I featured that in my pop-up section of our training um, just because it was so different from what I was seeing in other live interviews uh, that I really like that you're at the point in which the user is asking the question or, or is being asked the question, you have that information and additional multimedia resources uh, available, including you know video and that kind of stuff that really takes it to the next level. And it's because we can't be there, right? So we <laughs> have to put as much as, you know, anticipate all the questions that we would be asked. So yeah. even though we try to do everything in plain English, you know, and, and in bite-sized chunks, we do try to, to add as much more as we can. When you're thinking about projects that you're going to work on next or the next form that you're going to automate with your team, how do you think through that automation or how do you choose the forms that you are going to pick? Is it um, grant funding? Like you have money to do this kind of thing, like with COVID, you know, there was a pool of money there for for automation. Or is there a a larger process that goes through when you guys pick the forms you're going to automate? Yeah, I mean, you know, as you point out, we're a grant funded organization. And so... um... Yeah, I mean, everything that we do has to be posted to a grant. We've been really lucky to have disaster-related funding. And, you know, as horrible as it is, disasters really do impact people in a lot of different ways. And so, you know, that's let us build interviews for debt collection and uh, foreclosure, mortgage, you know, uh, modifications, uh, landlord-tenant issues, evictions, writs of risk, you know, utility shutoffs, lockouts. You know, we have one that it 
that actually explains how to comply with what in Texas are new required uh, disclosures in civil procedures. And so, you know, we walk through the whole process of how many witnesses do you think you'll have for each witness? What is the information you need to disclose, you know, about the parties and all the rest of it? So in that sense, we've we've been lucky to be able to address a lot of different topics. And then from there, you know, what we look for, as I said before, we look for the things that people can do themselves. We're again, we're not trying to build, you know, a law school course on what is, you know, what is family law or what are marital relations or the the parent child relationship, right? We're trying to say, are you experiencing this? And if so, here are some things you can do when you're in that situation. So those are and and then from there, what we do, look, we're a small team. I have I have an attorney, April Williams, who was on the project. I have two paralegals, uh, Graham Cull and Andrea Martinez, and that's it. We're generalists in this sense. And so what we do is we do the research that we need to for the first draft of this. We figure out what is the question flow, uh, what are the pieces of information we're going to give, or the documents that we can help them assemble. And then what we do is... Um, we take that and we user test user test it internally with a group of uh, subject matter experts. So we get the practice group together. We do you know one or two two hour sessions, run through the whole thing, and then incorporate that feedback into our first draft of the interview, which we then user test with people who are not attorneys because we want to make sure right we've got plain language in there, plain English so that people can understand that it's inclusive language. Uh, that the steps and instructions that we give are comprehensible. So, I mean, that starting from what, which ones do we do to how do we get there? Those are sort of the steps we take. You said your subject matter experts, those are other attorneys that are in that practice area within Lone Star. So it's all internal up to the point of user testing or non-attorney testing. Yeah, that's true for the ones that we are doing. It's true for our A to J interviews and our, our videos and, and attendant materials. The disaster project we actually did with um, two other organizations in Texas. Texas has three LSC funded organizations that cover the state. And so that we did in collaboration with Legal Aid of Northwest Texas and uh, Texas Rio Grande Legal Aid. And so when we would do, we had the same approach there, that review team would pull practitioners across all three organizations. So it was a lot more coordination. Uh, we learned a lot from that process, because that was the first one we went through and it really streamlined our, our internal process that we use for our subsequent um, tools. Now your internal team with you and April um, and the, you, uh, your two paralegals that you have, do you all sort of divide and conquer? Do you work collaboratively? How do you divide up the work um, within your own organization or, or manage that workflow within your team? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we do work very collaboratively. I mean, we have, yeah, I come from a, pro, a software background, and so we have a stand-up meeting every morning, uh, and we go through and we try to figure out, you know, what are the things that are blocking us from the day before. We do tend to specialize, so um, you know, Graham mostly focuses on the legal research and uh, you know helps with some drafting. Andrea does our A to J programming, and so we the way we develop an interview, we create these documents that have either the list of questions that's in a flow, maybe that'll branch to another list of questions. They'll show maybe some piece of information for a page, that'll be a separate document. And so we'll have this whole pile of uh, either Google Docs or SharePoint Docs. They're annotated with, you know, before logic and after logic and branching instructions. So Andrea can take that and builds out sort of a visual representation of it in a tool that we use called Miro, which looks a lot like the, the tool that you have embedded in A to J author. And uh, then also takes those materials and can build an A to J interview based on those materials. So we yeah. do have specialties in there, but we do work together constantly. Yeah, we uh, had worked on the Miro in the Miro program before we did the revamp to the map section of A to J. So there is a lot of that modularity and nodes and that kind of stuff that we were trying to put back into the software. Um, but I think that's helpful to hear because different uh, organizations or, or new organizations may feel overwhelmed that, you know, they need a huge team or they need, um, you know, someone who is a programmer. And it's nice to hear that you can sort of split it up, that you can have different 
tech levels and different you know legal backgrounds that can incorporate and form a team that can get a lot of uh, good work out into the world. So good to hear. Um, in terms of your impact, then, so what what are you seeing in in reach? Is it um, just a specific jurisdiction in Texas that you're working at statewide? How many people are you hitting? What what sort of your reach of the project so far? So all of our tools are statewide. They're applicable statewide. Um, we don't have a lot of jurisdiction specific rules, although during COVID for the moratoriums, we did have some of those. We incorporated them in our uh, landlord tenant tool. Our, we have five, our five interviews for in A to J are the landlord tenant, the debt collection, uh, foreclosure and mortgage, unemployment benefits, and we have the disclosures one. And our two big ones are the disclosures because everybody with a civil procedure needs that. And so they find our tool and use it and landlord tenant, which, you know, is just a huge issue here as I'm sure it's everywhere else. Uh, those are helping thousands of people a year. The other ones are in the range of hundreds a year. So. I mean, yeah, that's like not a sniff to those either, right? Like helping hundreds of that's people right. Is, right. is huge, right? Like that you're you're if you had those same sort of numbers of in-person representation the same help that you're giving them through the internet uh people would be blown away and so uh that's amazing that you know tens of thousands of people in texas are being helped with five forms that your little team you know <laughs> puts out there on the internet working together so i love that just in terms of your workflow one more question on that how do you keep them updated maintenance so that is another thing that i see coming up in our community of authors that uh, because we are grant funded and a lot of these projects, they become one off projects, but we know the law changes, the form changes. I mean, COVID showed us that it can change in, you know, in a day. How do you keep them and how do you keep them up and maintained and still good law so they can continue to have that impact year after year? Yeah, that's a good question. And, um, you know, I realize that we're, you know, a small team, but we're also four people, which is probably a big team compared to what some organizations can field, right? And so we have, we do have, you know, seven different legal topics in our disaster portal, five for our A to J. We've got, you know, videos and fact sheets and form handouts that, that we work with people uh, to give out. What we were doing prior to this year is what probably everyone does, right? I mean, you would you'd put these things on a schedule. I mean, I remember um, when we first started this, we had, there was a presentation by um, LaDeirdre Johnson, I think, at uh, LSNTAP, who had a spreadsheet, right, of all of the different interviews that they were going through and, and you know, scheduling one by one for a review. So we were doing that too. Uh, it was probably on the order of about every two years, which in Texas is not that bad because our legislature meets every two years, um, but it doesn't really account for uh, changes in regulations, right? Or um, on the federal level, any sort of statutory or regulatory changes. So, um, you know, we were we were finding that a review would take, you know, up to six weeks of our of our four person team, right? And eighty to ninety percent of the stuff that we reviewed didn't change, but it still had to be reviewed, right? So we're sitting there spending six weeks every two years on each of these things, and that time that we spend on keeping them up to date is necessary. But it, you know, it takes time away from us developing new stuff. So, and it's not, it's not interesting, right? It's it's painting the road or paving the potholes, and like sometimes the road is fine, but you still got to drive over it to make sure that it's still there, and that's a huge drain on your resources. So, what do you, what have you done? This is a, this is a softball into your uh, presentation, but so what have you done to sort of deal with that uh, that burden? Right. So I appreciate the softball. So mm -hmm. um, so we last year, or actually in 2022, we um, we put in a technology improvement grant application to LSC, and we got a grant to build a piece of software that we call LACI, Legal Aid Content Intelligence. And the idea behind this really stems from the fact that everything that we publish, especially to the public, but even internally, right? I mean, briefs and memos, filings, whatever. Um, you know, we don't write fiction. Everything has to have an authority attached to it. It's got to refer to a statute or a regulation or a rule or, you know, some authoritative information on a website or a form that somebody's promulgating. And so in Texas, 
our legislature passed a version of what's called the UELMA, the Uniform Electronic Materials Act, Access Act, something like that. And uh, there are about 22 states across the country who have now adopted some version of that. It's the legislature committing to put legal materials online so that they're accessible by the public and they're maintained as an authoritative source. And so we thought, all right, that's the missing piece, right? So we can write some software that if it knows for each of our documents what the authorities are that underlie the documents, then it can go periodically check them online, tell us if one of those changed, and if one of them has changed, which documents need to be reviewed. So it's like an early warning system. I'm going to go ahead and share. Actually, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and turn off my video for a second so I don't look like a dork doing this. But let's see. I'm going to move this to my other screen and then share this screen. All right. So that should share. Perfect. So this is the software that we call Lacey. When you log in, it's got a dashboard that shows you the documents that have been loaded into the system and their status. And the dashboard shows you all the ones that you are monitoring. And because I'm sort of the default person to monitor everything, my name's on all of these. But um, we so far have 835 documents that we're, we're monitoring and managing in Lacey. And in order to make it a little more manageable, we've separated them into projects. And so, you know, we can narrow this down to just the ones in our A to J debt collection or employment benefits and see what the status of, of the different documents are in there. And you can see April and Graham are also on these documents. Uh, I can look at all documents and see all the ones that are monitored by everyone. And I can look through and see which ones have different statuses. Now, a document is going to have one of, it's going to have a one of two statuses in one of two areas. And that's either a document is going to show up as one of its authority has changed, in which case we'll see a document show up under review pending. My team has cleared all of those up, which is good. Um, or you'll see a document that has, uh, if a document says that it's changed, then its authorities need reviewing. And so what does that mean? Lacey knows Lacey doesn't store the documents itself. It stores instead a link to each of the documents. And our documents are generally in Google Docs for our collaborative disaster related project or in SharePoint for our Lone Star only projects. And um, it'll tell which project it's in, who's monitoring it. And when a Lacey knows when a document has changed outside of Lacey. So every night we go through, we walk through all of our 835 documents and we update what's called the last modified date in Lacey. So if somebody touches a document outside of Lacey, by that evening, Lacey knows. Uh, it also knows when the document is first entered, right? There's It knows when the last time the authorities were updated. If a document is loaded for the first time, there's never been an authority update. So we know this one needs to be reviewed. It needs to have authorities added to it. And then when that's done, we'll do the authorities review complete. Is the idea that the content that Lacey is looking at would be other practice areas are updating the content, other people outside of the team, like who besides your team would be updating the content? Yeah, that's that a good it question. Needs to keep checking on the Google Doc. So... When we expand Lacey to include uh, more documents across the organization, like uh, handouts and fact sheets, or even internal briefs or memos or filings, that will become, you know, then then we will have more people updating documents. And Lacey needs to know. We won't know offhand which documents have changed. But honestly, as we go through and we we're doing a, a review of our uh, FEMA materials right now. In fact, TDLH FEMA is the one we're currently working on. Uh, obviously, we're just starting hurricane season, and so this is the time for us to do this. We're going to be touching a bunch of these, and it's hard for us to keep track of them, right? But it's nice that Lacey's going to know. And as we come in tomorrow, we'll see which ones have been updated and need to be uh, need to be reviewed. Right. So the authorities, you know, we can they they should be pretty easy to uh, to add to a document. This, if an authority has already been entered into the system, you can just pick it from the list. Right. So I'm, well, 
unemployment caused by a major disaster actually would be a, applicable to FEMA. And then let's see, uh, unemployment, let's look at labor code. There are a bunch of um, one uh, references to uh, state law. There's, let's see if there's a web, there's got to be a FEMA website. Yep. All right. Disaster declarations. So we can add authorities here. And once we click review complete, then Lacey knows that if there's a change to any of these, then in our emails that we get daily or weekly, this, this document here, what is the Small Business Association, also known as the SBA, that'll show up in our email and say, okay, that needs to be reviewed. It'll also show up in the dashboard. In fact, I'm just going to pop over there because that'll clear this out. So I don't want to update that because they're in the middle of that. You can see all of the authorities that we've got um, currently in the system, how many, we have 452, and there are different types. So TAC is the Texas Administrative Code. That is uh, our equivalent to the CFR, so regulations. USC is the US Code, so we have all of the federal um, statutes in there. CFR are the federal regulations. There are also general PDFs. So this lets us keep track of forms that people have online if a form changes, and we detect that by extracting all the text from the form and comparing it to the text that we had in a form, uh, then we'll get an alert. Uh, websites the same way. If there's something that's not a statute, a regulation, or a rule, uh, it's just a website. For example, our Texas Workforce Commission has a definition of wages. Well, they have this on this, they have this website, and there's a, a little bit of coding right now that we're going to make easier to do in the next version if we get funding for it uh, that says, okay, we're just looking at the definition for wages or we're looking at the definition for waiting week or we're just looking at the part that talks about Title V of our rules of civil procedure. That way we're not distracted. Lacey's not, we, <laughs> Lacey's not distracted by extraneous stuff on a page like sidebars or ads or things that get updated. Uh, we can zoom in onto the part that we want. We Are have you so this might be my this might be my uh, lack of techiness showing, but how, where are you storing the the source of Lacey's truth for what it used for like what a website used to be or what wages used to be? Like, is that all have to be loaded in a database that it's then comparing what's live on on the other site or like how does it know that it changed? What it does is um, so that there's a, actually there are a couple answers I think to that question. One is. Um, how does Lacey know that we need to watch this one? And that is, it's, it's, I won't sugarcoat it. It is the legal research necessary to determine for each document, what are the authorities under the document? And we have 835 pages that we have to go back and for each page, determine what these are. Now, going forward, we know we have Lacey. Going forward, as we develop any new piece, we're going to include this up front, right? So it's not a big review process all at once. Um, so, so that research and data entry is necessary for any legacy set of documents. We know that Lacey last checked this one four days ago, and the last change on it was one month ago. So we can take, and, and I'll show you here, this one doesn't have a last checked or last change. The reason for that is, um, for whatever reason, we entered this authority into the system and associated it with a document, but um, it currently doesn't have any related documents. So we decided that, I guess, at some point there was a better source for the definition of wages. And so we took this authority off a document. When when a document, when an authority has no documents, we don't bother checking it. So there's there's some smarts in there. For something that does have documents, for example, um, you know, this uh, definition of a waiting week, it's associated with this um message that we give in our unemployment insurance interview we can see the changes that were detected on the 5th of may now this version of lacy that i'm showing you is our production it's a copy of our production lacy we uh finished development of the software on april 30th and so we brought our production system live on may 3rd so you'll see a lot of these things have um, original text, essentially empty, and then a new text in here that is the current text of the of the authority. 
Going forward, when an authority changes, this new text will be the original text, and there will be whatever the new text is to compare it against. Right? And then we'll see if that change actually makes sense for that document. So for example, well, we won't actually be able to see it here because it was a zero. Yeah, there was no meaningful change on that one. So, but when when you go to a document and a document says it needs content review because an authority has changed, you will see all of the authorities on the document and each of them will let you see what the change is on the document. And so just for grins, um, because this is our test system, let's do this. Definition of wages. This is the new definition of wages. All right, we can simulate changes in the system, which is kind of handy for things like this. So now, if we go to, oh, we're not doing wages, sorry. It was working week. Let's do that again. Definition waiting week. All right, so now if we go back to this and we go to unemployment insurance, it shows up as content review. Here's the original text. Here's the new text. It's This change is currently in a pending state. When we look at our document, we can decide if that doc, if this change was relevant to that document. Maybe it's not. Maybe we're not talking about the thing that changed in here. Maybe they just uh, changed a date in here or some punctuation. We can dismiss it as irrele an irrelevant change. If the review caused us to make a change in the document, then we can say review complete. The reason why we're making a distinction between those two is that we're hoping that this puts us in a position down the road in a subsequent version of Lacey to train um, to train an AI, what's called a Bayesian classifier. Going forward, it could tell us you know, here's a change to this. I think it's 90% likely to be useful, or maybe it's 10% likely to be useful. So if we get a bunch of changes all at once, we can then prioritize them. So anyway, we're starting to collect that information uh, as we go. Again, this is our test, Lacey, so uh, I can make whatever changes I want in here. And, um, and look, if you're interested in um, playing around with it, let me know, and uh, we can make you an, an account in here, and you can play around with it for a little while, at least until we the next time we need to wipe it and rebuild it. But there's always that danger of um test server, <laughs> like people into the test server to play around and like, oh, your data might be gone. But yeah. No, exactly. that uh that looks really cool. I like the idea that you saw a problem with your current system, built the tool to uh to help you work around that hurdle, and then also are looking to the future in ways in which you can use AI and like future technologies to uh to further decrease the burden of uh, form automation and maintenance. Yeah, and it's uh, it turns out that it's just such a really simple, uh, you know, it's a, a really simple piece of software. It is hopefully going to uh, help help us avoid doing that long review at the end of each uh, review cycle at the end uh, every two years, because we will have been reacting to changes as they go. And again, this covers statutes, regulations, rules. Uh, the Texas Rules of Civil Procedure are in there. Um, we're looking to finish out building out the federal rules, civil procedure and evidence. Um, and then, you know, if someone wanted to adopt this in a different state, first of all, you would want to be in a ULMA state, right? You want to make sure that you have your legal materials online. Uh, we would have to teach Lacey how to understand the rules and regulations and stuff in your state. But then it should be pretty easy for somebody to adopt. Um, and, you know, this is an LSC project. Oh, thank you, John, for putting, putting the link to the ULMA in there. Um, this should be, you know, for uh, this is an LSC project. It's very easy for us to make this available to other LSC organizations because that's a grant condition, right? Anything we build has to be available to other LSC grantees. But we're figuring out how to, you know, what license to release this under and how to make this more generally available. That's awesome. Um, what uh, do you envision the code being just put up on GitHub? Do you envision this being a hosted service where you integrate with other um, states to build out a larger sort of Lacey repository? Is it going to be sort of an individual organization maintains their own Lacey instance and repository? 
Well, that's a good question. I mean, this is version 1.0. So, you know, you guys have been- Don't have it all solved? No. <laughs> y'all have 20 some odd years under A to J author. So y'all had a little more time to work on it. But um, so those are all good questions. Um, right now, it's currently set up in anticipation of everybody running their own Lacey server, right? But again, not everybody has the uh, expertise or the tech staff to be able to do that. We definitely, when we figure out which license we want to release it under, it will be an open license. So again, we can't anticipate always getting funding to continue to move this forward or, you know, heaven forbid, fix bugs, right? But if we have this in an open repository, more people can participate in the you know, in its maintenance and, and extension and expansion. Um, there is a possible, if we could figure out a way to fund it, right, we could do something like y'all do at a to j.org and have a single LACI. The idea of projects means that, you know, you, you can limit people to just the projects that are relevant to their organizations. And so people don't really have to step on each other and you would only have one staff having to maintain it. But um, those are all logistical and funding issues, right, that would be nice to figure out going forward in the next couple of years. Yeah. Um, how long does your TIG run? Like, does uh, is it wrapping up this year? So like the, the reporting and that kind of stuff, like you said, you finished the code at the end of, um, of April. Is this sort of done for this round of the TIG funding? We are, um, we're looking to continue evaluating it through the end of November. So that's a 2022 TIG cycle. Yeah, and then what happens after that depends on um, how we do on any other funding that we're looking for. Right. The next cycle that, that starts again in, in June with the final. Right. Um, okay, so uh, with Lacey and helping build in the ability to reduce time for your staff and having to you know spend on review, do you envision um, being able to build out more content in your team of four um, do you see more wraparound, more forms, more uh, going deeper into specific areas? Where do you see the future of your document automation moving now that you have this lazy tool to back you up as well? Yeah, I mean, we're hoping to be able to expand the number of uh, number of tools that we have or expand the reach of the tools that we currently have. Um, you know, we current we not only have the underlying documents for our A to J interviews, but we've got scripts for uh, for our videos. You know, we've got um, well, like I said before, fact sheets and handouts and stuff in there. So um, we're also looking to expand it internally to um, address, you know, filings and briefs and memos and, and you know, legal research materials and, and other uh, legal documents. So at least internally, uh, we're looking to, to broaden the reach there. Um, yeah. So if you uh, could give one piece of information or one piece of advice for those who uh, are here today who may not have a form automation project or who may not be um, as techy as your team is or isn't building out these cool tools, but is interested in sort of dipping their toe into the water, what what advice could you give to someone who's just starting out or thinking about a project? Yeah, I mean, I guess the first one is um, it, this is a lot of work, but don't be daunted because, you know, you can you can get easily started with a tool like A to J. And, you know, if Lacey takes off, um, you know, that can help you maintain it. I'm still amazed that uh, Lydia had a, what was it, a thousand things in her spreadsheets. Uh, I love that. Thing. The color coding, the like the ability to collapse that other people, yeah, it was beautiful. And it was, was a Google beautiful. spreadsheet, I think too. So like they right. shared it, you know, on the internet. So maybe we'll get there someday, but, um, you know, you always start a, a journey with a single step. Um, we benefited a lot. I keep mentioning, you know, uh, people that we learned from before. And so maybe the most important thing would be try to collaborate with another organization who's done this before. It's helpful to find larger organizations like Lone Star. Uh, you know, we have the resources to be able to do it. You know, also look for other organizations that are have resources similar to yours and see, you know, how they may juggle uh, what they're doing with um with maintaining these sorts of things. Yeah. And then it's a, it's a, I feel like, I mean, unfortunately I have 20 years experience before becoming a lawyer. So to me, this feels like a really low barrier to entry. It seems really easy to pick up A to J author and just start playing with it. Right. There's um, especially if you don't publish it, there's, there's nothing you can break by playing around with it and, you know, seeing how you can automate a form or, um, you know, walk through a legal topic and try to explain it. So 
Yeah. I, uh, I, with Lacey, when you were describing it, I'm like thinking of ways to connect it. And we have the citation tool within Ada J Author that we envisioned, we, we saw this problem that, you know, Ada J has been around since 2005. Some of our interviews when we were doing the conversion from the flash based version to the web based version were from like 2007 and it was 2016, you know, 14, 15 at the time. So they were old and like we, we saw that this, this need to keep up with it was going to be there. And so we have citation fields for those of you that don't have access to Lacey and aren't tagging all of this data. You can start tagging all of your interviews right now in those citation fields that then in the future could be pulled into Lacey as all of those, um, the relevant the regulations, statutes, memos in, inside your organization, all of those things that help you build out an interview and are the reason you ask a question a certain way, all of that can start being tagged in your current interviews so that then it can be put into a system like Lacey and um, you won't have to go through and re-annotate 800 pieces of documentation um, if you start building that up. So um, because I'm a glutton for punishment and we're here, is there anything uh, that you would change about A to J author that you, you obviously I have you on here because you work with A to J and um, you know, we love having Lone Star as part of our A to J family. But um, is there something you would change about the software or something that you wish it could do that it doesn't at this point? Well, you know, um, AI is really hot. And uh, one of the things that we've been playing what? with... Completely new information. No. Let me explain this AI no, thing to you. Yeah. yeah. So um, so we've been playing around with it. And one of the things we built out was um, this uh, web, web application, a very simple proof of concept, essentially, where we can plug in a text, because we're always trying to get to plain language, right? Fifth to sixth grade reading level. And so we figured out a way to get chat GPT also coordinated with the Dale Chawl readability formula, right? So that it knows it can evaluate what the readability is using that formula and get it to reduce some of our, we had 10, 11th grade texts in there that because they had a lot of, you know, you have to have technical terms in there, but, but to bring the reading level down, you can provide uh, understandable definitions of them. And so we finally engaged AI to be able to do that. And so um, I think, Yep, the Dale Chaw readability formula. One of the things that, this is not your question, I'm sorry, this is a tangent, yeah, but one of the reasons why we like Dale Chaw is that it is a, a readability formula that, that is built around common words as opposed to trying to guess how many syllables or words or, or sentences there are. Insurance is a three-syllable word, but it's a word that people know, right? So insurance shows up as a harder word under the flesh Kincaid calculation because it's counting syllables, uh, but not so under Dale Chaw. And so um, we just think Dale Charles a, a better indicator. And in our user testing, we actually measured each of our texts using both Flesh Kincaid and Dale Chawl. And the Dale Chawl seemed to track better with the feedback we got from people. So yeah, if you could figure out a way to integrate, all these AIs now have APIs, right? And so A to J author probably could integrate with a, an AI to help reduce stuff to plain language. That'd be great, especially in other languages where that tool is yeah. harder. Yeah, I've been since coming back from the ITC conference in January, I've been playing a lot with how can without grant funding, without being a tech person, without being able to change the code of A to J, how can we use AI to improve the experience for authors and then the ultimate result? And so I added into my uh, training over ramp uh, um, a section about using it for first drafts for it did really well just throwing in the text of a form as a prompt and then going back and forth with it and helping it uh, helping me to develop questions that I want to ask and then reviewing those for plain language and you know say it again in a third in a fifth grade you know reading level say it again in more common language like it, it helps where you could do it yourself but again it's the same idea with Lacey like you could hand check 800 pieces of documentation every two years but it takes six weeks same idea with the, with the AI is what I'm seeing is that it's not a replacement a one-to-one -one replacement it's a assistant to your process and just speeding it up and making it more efficient overall but you still have to have the expertise to say, just like in your Lacey, like, no, that's irrelevant. That change doesn't matter, or this doesn't make sense in the context. It's not, um, it's not going to do, you're not turning Lacey on and saying, forget it, we don't ever have to check our content again. You know, it's the same idea with the AI that it, you can use it to assist you. That's where I'm saying it most. 
Um, I, and I, actually, I, Lacey, one of the things we've been finding is not, not only that it helps us with our documents, but we've sometimes scooped some of our, you know, subject area experts by saying, hey, this, we just saw this change, you know, got posted to a statute or a regulation. You also take a look at it. So it's been kind of fun <laughs> that way too. Yeah, that water cooler, like one up uh, on the team uh, there, I like that. Sure. Um, yeah, uh, cool. So um, I'm going to hold for questions for just a second, but just a big thank you, uh, Luigi, for talking about your program, about talking about how Lone Star, um, your approach to uh, document automation and Lacey and showing us a cool new tool. Uh, I'm sure as part of your grant, you'll be walking around in other presentations and other things. So we're I'm excited to see it um, again and see where it can go once you're out of the, the evaluation phase. Well, thanks for inviting me. I mean, I, I really appreciate you doing it. You and I have presented before at ITC. This is this is really easy to do, so I appreciate the invitation. And uh, yeah, really, thank you guys for A to J and A to J author. It's been a really, it's been helpful to us to be able to build these things. And I think it's been a real boon to our, our client population who really need this. Thanks. All right, so um, I'm gonna show now just a little bit of the training revamp. And then, so if you have questions, start thinking about them. Uh, for Luigi, but um, what I'm going to show now is a uh, revamp that I've been working on. And like any good Netflix series, um, we're releasing this training revamp in two parts. So the first part rolled out at midnight tonight, uh, or last th this morning. Um, but this training revamp is on our website. What you're here now is a to jauthor.org. Um, and under the learn tab is our new a to j author training course. The training course is broken into four large parts. Um, it handles uh, an introduction and sort of an understanding about document assembly. It covers the template, covers the interview, and then uh, it covers sustainability and exiting and sort of the finishing off of the project. Within each one of these new training sections, I have training videos, I have fun exercises, um, I built out a thing like a word search for those terms of art that you might want to use uh, or start to use when you're in learning a new software tool in A to J. Um, there are what I call applied workflows, which are little mini exercises, things you can do in about 10 to 15 minutes. There's longer training exercises that are in here that are uh, focused on the video. And then each one of the videos, um, they're all linked here. I'm, I'm pointing like you can see them on my other screen here, sorry. Um, but they're also on our YouTube channel under a new uh, playlist. So our training, I'm gonna pause it so it doesn't start. Oh. Uh, each one is a short video. So sometimes they're between, you know, two and five minutes long in general. Some of them are longer when it goes more in depth into the weeds of the software and exactly like what button to click to do what. Uh, but the idea is that these videos are edited, concise, and to the point in which you need it at, just like A to J, at the point in which you need to know how to do a macro or a function or a pop-up or to add a page or whatever it is, you can watch this short little YouTube video, do the little exercise, and uh, learn the feature in A to J. And so as part of this summer webinar series that you're all attending, this training series is rolling out. Um, and I released the first part of it, like I said, today, and the second part will roll out August 1st. Um, I don't assume that anyone is going to be able to get through all of the training exercise and videos before then. And so it just made it easier for me in terms of recording videos and getting the content out there for you. But if you start going through it and uh, you hit any snags, I'd love to hear about it. Or if there's something that's missing, I'd love to hear about it. Check it, check it out. Let me know. My contact and Luigi's contact will be uh, on a screen in just a second. But for those of you that may be unfamiliar, A to J Author is a product of Cali, the Center for Computer Assisted Legal Instruction. We're a 501c3 nonprofit that is made up of a membership of law schools. And one of the things that we're most known for are the Cali Awards, which uh, the Cali Excellence for the Future Awards are given to the law student in each law school class who gets the highest grade. So it's a lot of work uh, to, to get the highest grade to Cali, a law school course. I assume you're going to put the same amount of effort into this training. Um, and so if you complete the entire training course, and you answer a couple of questions that we have on a Google form, 
you also can Cali, A to J author, and get a Cali award for uh, the commitment that you've put into access to justice and form automation and making the, the justice process just a little bit easier for self-represented litigants. So that's all on the new uh, automating forms with A to J author training page which is on our website, a to jauthor.org, under the Learn tab, the A to J Author training course. Uh, just a reminder that our, our series for this summer highlight series is four, four sessions, uh, this being the first with Luigi. On July 9th, Alex Rabinal from Chicago Kent Law School is going to talk about how he uses A to J Author in uh, a justice and technology practicum. Then on uh, August 6th, Allison Ludley from Community Legal Aid, uh, Legal Education of Ontario, CLEO, is going to talk about how their organization is using A to J Author to build out guided pathways in Canada that they're hoping to expand beyond Ontario to the entire entirety of Canada to help their self-represented litigant population. And then uh, our, we'll wrap up the series on September 10th with Scott Emery from the Kentucky Administrative Offices of the Courts. Kentucky came on uh, during COVID. They didn't have any forms before COVID hit. And then um, within a year and a half or so, they uh, have 12 forms up and running. Um, they regularly get featured on the news. Um, they have been on the PBS station, their um, CBS affiliates, and they get a lot of publicity for what their court is doing to help self-represented litigants, part of which involves Ada J. Author. So uh, Scott will come and talk about that. The same link that you all are on here um, at 11 a.m. Central on those dates. And uh, I will, if there aren't any questions or y'all aren't ready yet, uh, the contact information for Luigi is here on the screen um, with his email and mine as well that you can feel free to reach out over the course of the month. Um, if you have questions about A to J for me, or um, if you are interested in Lacey and want to test it out, and uh, as uh, Luigi said, you guys can get a test account for them. All right. Thank you, Jessica. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Well, no questions then. Uh, thank you all for attending, and I hope to see you all back in July, and happy, happy June, happy start of summer. Thank you.